are thrilled to be joined by celebrated Latin Grammy winning songwriter Claudia Brandt. Along with her partner in conversation today, let's welcome Lauren Medina, founder and head of Guerrera PR. Over to you two. Thank you so much. Hola, Claudia. ¿Cómo estás? Hola, un placer. It's an honor as your friend and colleague to be here today and speaking with you and um, highlighting some of your most notable accomplishments. You have an impressive resume as a songwriter, as an artist that honestly anyone would dream of having one day. Um, let's see, seven Latin Grammy and Grammy nominations, collaborations with artists from Bruno Mars to Jesse Reyes, Camila Cabello, Mark Anthony, Ricky Martin, just to name a few. And other incredible, incredible accomplishments, you are the only woman to be a member of the National Board of Trustees of the Recording Academy, and you are the West Coast VP of the Latin Songwriters Hall of Fame. That's pretty impressive. Yeah, the so, only Latina in the board. <laughs> <laughs> So um, let's jump right in. So tell us how you got started and when or how you discovered that you had a talent for songwriting and was your family supportive of you following a career in music? Um, well, I started when I was very little. I, I'm a single child, so I didn't have any brothers or sisters and my parents at home, I'm from Argentina. Uh, back in Buenos Aires, they would have, you know, the stereo and the, they would play the vinyls and they would listen to a lot of, you know, jazz and boleros and Sinatra. And I didn't really have the upbringing of, you know, listening to the Beatles or the Stones. For me, it was more like more melodic stuff that my parents would listen to because I don't have it. I didn't have any brothers or sisters. So when I was around six years old, they gave me a guitar. They bought me a guitar that was kind of gonna be my, my my keep me company for the rest of my life i still have it it's here in my studio it's destroyed because we're saying it's like i don't know 45 years old but uh they gave it to me and i so i started you know devoting my time to i would i would lock the the bathroom door and play inside the bathroom because the acoustics were great so i started uh you know kind of playing by ear some of the songs that I liked from the records I was listening to at home. And then they put me in classes and guitar lessons. I learned probably the same 50 chords that I know now, not more than that. And with that, you know, the fact that I was on my own, I you know, it allowed me, instead of, you know, having friends over all the time or hanging out with my brothers and sisters, I would be playing guitar. So I would, you know, start writing ideas in a, in a notebook and then I would grab one tape recorder and, 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 and record a melody with a guitar and then I would got, grab another tape recorder and put two play rec uh, two recorders and I would do the, the harmony on the other one. I mean, somehow I was, I was starting to, to make it work as like an, uh, a multi-track situation that I didn't know. Um, so that, that went on and on and, until, you know, I became, I went to high school and I, I had to pursue, a, I had to go to college. I had no choice. It was like, you're not going to, if you want to go make music, you're going to starve the rest of your life. So I went to college and I, and I studied architecture, which was from all the careers that were available was one that had a, more of a creative side because I didn't want to be a doctor or, or an attorney and I did two years there while I was already writing songs and more professionally and doing recording sessions as a singer and there was a moment where I said I gotta quit this because it's not this is not for me and I decided to go with music uh, devote my life to music all the way amazing and how did your parents feel when you decided to quit were they supportive was it a challenge for them they were very mad they were very pissed. it was like a big um i mean deception i would say i don't know what the word is like how come they were disappointed disappointing right yes. it's una decepción en español que sí. like cómo vas a cómo te vas a dedicar a la música te vas a morir de hambre tienes que terminar la carrera tienes que tener un título all of those things but I, I mean, it was it was stronger than than myself. I mean, I couldn't help it, and I was very unhappy at college. And I was, you know, I was just doing it because I had to, but it was not in my heart. 
Right, right. And, and you know, throughout the years when I started achieving some kind of success, uh, they finally said, well, you know what? We have to accept it. You were on the right path and you made the right decision. So. Right. Wow. So a little rebellion took you a long way and the plaques that are in back of you, some of the plaques that are in back of you <laughs> show that, right? Show, show that that rebelling sometimes gets you gets you pretty far, right? Yeah, that's, um, that's why I, I, I love your work and I, and I look up to what you do so much because the, the name of your you. company, which is Guerrera, has everything to do with um, where my heart is, you know? The only way that, that we can really accomplish things is, is if, we, if we fight for them. And, and, and I, I was not gonna, you know, let myself stay in college and become an architect and just draw uh, houses, plans for houses when, you know, I just, wanted to sit down and play my guitar and sing so yeah, yeah we can't fight our calling that's for sure mm -hmm. all right so um the next question um i think you know a lot of people who would be watching this right now uh would want to know what's your creative process like especially when you're collaborating with another artist um or with another songwriter and also, what's your creative process when you're creating music for yourself, which I'm assuming could possibly be a bit different? Yeah, it's completely different. I mean, the the when when I usually when I write music uh, for artists, I usually do it with the artists. It's very rare that I pitch songs for a certain project. I used to do it when I first started. Then, you know, my dream when I first started was to like be able to get in the room with the artist. And luckily, like six, seven years into it, when I moved to LA, uh, that started happening. So I started, you know, getting Enrique here and Kani here and 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 Ricky here and Natalia Jimenez here and Ray here and all you know, or ended up in the studio with the artist. And uh, what I try to do when my process when I when I collaborate with an artist is that I try to be a little bit of a of a shrink for for a little while because i really need to understand their personality their taste their likes i can't just do it more like i would say like nashville style where you know i i, I love nashville and i've been there many times but you know it's a, it's a different process it's like hi how are you my name is so and so let's write a song about what let's find the concept done boom Right. When I work with an artist, they, they, they all have their own universe and their own sensitivity and they're very particular in many ways and very special. So I really need to get to know them and spend time with them. And, and that's the only thing that kind of nurtures me to be able to then deliver something that's unique. I just can't do it. It's not, it's not a factory here. You know, right. there are days that I can write, there are days that I cannot write, there are artists that I like more, there are artists that I like less. In general, before I get to work with an artist, and I'm lucky enough at this uh, stage in my career where I can I get to pick and choose, I need to listen to their music and understand the character and see some interviews and see if I'm, I really think I'm going to click with this person. Because right. it's, to write a song is a very intimate moment right you need to have that connection so that's how it works when i when i collaborate and when i do songs that i just write on my own for myself for whatever project i'm interested in doing uh then it's more like you know 2 a.m in the morning a glass of wine and i don't write <laughs> anything today like, and i have this melody in my head and i just sit down and there's there's a lot of more, um, I would say, freedom about it because I don't need to uh, the, the comply is not the word, but I don't need to go by the the style that the label wants, the direction the project is going to take, uh, the emotional situation of the artist. I just go by whatever I feel. And I enjoy that too. I do it less, of course, but I do it as well. Right. That's incredible. I, I definitely identify with that um, as part of being a publicist. Um, for me, it's all about the artist's story, not just their trajectory and their accomplishments, but what do they stand for, what they're about. And that um, actually, for me, um, is a 
big uh, indicator on whether I'm going to take that project or not. Exactly. Um, and so I, I really go out of my way to get to know my clients so I can be able to tell their story, right? And so um, with songwriting, you're telling that story as well, but you're telling that story through a song, right? In PR, I'm, I'm telling that story to media, right, um, about the songs. And so um, that's 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 incredible. I wish I could drink a glass of wine and write a press release, and I've tried that many times before, but it doesn't work for me. <laughs> All right, so that leads me to the next question. Um, thinking about your career, what would you say are the three most notable moments of your career? Moments that were the culmination of everything you've worked hard for. Moments that made you feel incredibly alive, fortunate that you cried that you could just call your parents and be like you see i did it this was what i was working for my whole life name name me three of those moments well uh I, yeah i've been thinking about it and i i i definitely was able to identify three three of them that are that i think are key in my life as a as a musician and as a songwriter and as an artist as well one was when uh, I won uh, the Viña del Mar contest in Chile, that was in 95. And uh, it was really interesting because, uh, you know, I went there with uh, a friend of mine who was the co-writer and, and my manager at that time. And there's a whole, there's a big, um, there's always been some kind of como rivalidad, rival, I don't know what the word is, between Chile and- a Rivalry. Right. Rivalry. Yes, and, and and the Viña del Mar contest takes place in 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 uh, La Quinta Vergara, which is a humongous stadium, and they do, throughout the years they have given the audience the power to say that they're called the the monster, el monstruo. So when you get on stage, if the the monstruo, the monster, this this like I don't know, it's like twenty thousand people, forty thousand people, it's a lot of people. And, they're, they're, and it's like the, the way that the stairs are put, it's like you have them on, right on front, right in your face. All this, <laughs> block, it's this wall of people. If they decide that you don't belong in there, they make sure you're kicked out. Wow. So they start booing and, wah, and screaming and you have to get, you have to, you have to get off the stage. So when they announced me and I went in and they said from Argentina, so and so, um, that started. And for the oh, first wow. five minutes where the orchestra or two minutes and a half where the Oscars orchestra was doing a big intro, I couldn't even hear what I was going to get in because of the screaming and the yelling and the get off bad. So I had two choices. I had, I could just, you know, do my thing and stay and survive or just leave the stage. And that was it. And I stayed. Of course you did. <laughs> and, I, and I made it to the second verse. And when it was already in the in the course, people became quiet. And I won the contest. I won, I won the, the, the first award. And when I got, got off of stage, I cried for probably, I don't know, an hour because it was, I, I was getting all this energy that in the beginning was like really devastating. And then I made it through. But it, it was it was such a powerful, you know, and then I, of course, I come back to my country and like, oh, she she dominated the monster. It's like, like that kind of thing. You know, she got she got to control the monster because they, they the, the monster, which is the audience, has that power in me. And my. So that was one moment that I remember that was really strong. And then the Amazing. second the second time was. Uh, when I was invited to a Sony, uh, to the Sony Studios um, recording session where Josh Groban was cutting a song I wrote with two friends of mine, uh, Klaus Derendorf and, and Mark Portman. And it was an 80 piece orchestra conducted by George Calandrelli and on the, on the board, it was David Foster and Umberto Gatica. And when I came in, and I saw that, which was my song being played by 80 people conducted by George with David and Umberto on the tape, on the, on the board. I was like, this is quite an accomplishment for me coming from South America, being a nobody 
like 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 witnessing this where they're actually recording a song that I wrote. That was like oh my god. That was a very uh unique moment, I think. Incredible. And then the third one was when I won um an American Grammy for for best Latin pop with the, that was on uh, 2019 it was almost like a year and a half ago which i was there by the way and screaming when you won <laughs> yeah, it was, because it was it was like what 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 did just happen because i mean i i did that record sincera like it was sincera i was like super honest i just wanted to make a, a record of beautiful music with the best musicians i can get with the best producers uh, not not really focusing on how commercial it's going to be, how long the songs should be to get airplay, uh, how much I'm going to shake my booty on the video. So, I mean, if I shake <laughs> my booty on the video now, no one would be interested anyway. <laughs> so I might as well, you know. Maybe, make, maybe, you never know. <laughs> I might as well make like beautiful music. And then the fact that the, the community the voters recognize that and without any kind of like strong promotion or or a, a million followers on, on on anywhere uh we made it to get an, an american grammy and go up on stage you know my producers and me che che Alara, Mugi and me and like we were crying like babies because that was like well you know you can still make great music and and, and get recognized for that which I think right. it's, 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 it's at the end, it's what we all want, right? Yes, absolutely. Sincera is a beautiful work of art and um, everyone should go and listen to it. And yeah, I mean, I think the Grammys has always done a really great job at uh, trying to really uh, focus on real musicianship and talent and you have that and to finally be recognized and win I'm, I was there. It was beautiful to see that. And congratulations again. Gracias. You really so, deserve that. I think those, those, three were, those three were like moments, important beautiful. moments. Beautiful. Beautiful. I can't even imagine um, what it would feel like to have 20,000 people booing you and you still went and did it and went through with it. That is unbelievable. <laughs> unbelievable. Well, um so this leads me to my next question. So um, <clears throat> how do you think that as being a woman, right, being a woman songwriter, how has that positively and negatively impacted you as a songwriter on a personal level uh, throughout your career? Um, because, of, because being a woman, first and foremost, is challenging. Um, and then you know, being a female songwriter, I'm sure has its challenges as well. So, but I want to hear the good and the bad, right? I think the, the I, I, I never experienced any kind of bullying or harassment of any kind. I've always done my work and try to keep my work ethics as intact as possible. Uh, it's complicated to, to stand your ground, especially in an industry right now that has, it's, it's very like rotten and corrupt in a lot of areas. So it's really hard to say, you know, no, I'm not gonna do this. No, thank you, I'm not interested. Uh, I think that, that that it's based a little bit on the leverage on, on the accomplishments you've made. Uh, I signed contracts when I started that were not the right contracts to sign, but I didn't know any better like everyone else. And, you know, I, I thought it was good. And then I realized it was not so good. So, you know, it only took me 30 years to sign the contracts that I think I should sign. Um, you know, on a personal level, it's complicated because, um, you know, there are very few women that are songwriters that can, you know, um, keep but with their careers and at the same time put, have a family or raise kids. It's like, it's like the, 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 these are two things that are not impossible, but it's very hard to combine. Uh, I raised my kids on my own. I'm a single mom and it's been pretty crazy. Uh, my kids are, are amazing because they, they, they had to learn the hard way that sometimes mom was in the studio till 4 a.m. in the morning and sometimes mom, you know, couldn't get up at 
10 a.m. to to take them to school, although I did get up at 7 to take them to school. I never, never missed a day of school because I was in the studio till 4 a.m. But then, you know, it's a, it's quite a challenge for, for, for me as a woman to be able to comply with work and do my thing and be fully focused on the artists that I have in my studio when, you know, my son woke up in the morning and, and he had a fever or he couldn't go to school or the teacher called me because, I'm, I mean, it's hard to combine. You need to have like an extra strength. I don't know where I got it from, but... I managed to do it. It's hard. It's not impossible. Most of my uh, songwriters, uh, friends, uh, women in the business, they have no kids. Um, especially in the young low market, most of my friends, colleagues, and if they do, they have one child. It's it's very complicated. Not impossible. Uh, and you right. need, of course to have a very if you have a husband that has to be very supportive and understanding because you know they have to. Do mommy duties sometimes if you really, you know, want to pursue a career and you're going to be in the studio with the artist until the mix is finalized or until you cut the vocals or until the song is done or it's like that. And also there's travel involved, which, you know, we go right to Europe, we go right to Puerto Rico, we help on a plane to go work with an artist in Mexico. That's like, you know, it's a lot of things that, that you need to, to keep in mind. Uh, if you want to have a family, you need to to have everything in place so to make sure that you can you can pursue your career, but also take care of your personal life. I think. Yeah, I understand that definitely. Um, okay, so um, what has been your experience writing records for male artists? Is that a different process uh, than writing for a female artist? Yeah, I mean, yeah, they, I have a lot of male friends. I get along equally well with, with guys or girls. There are different things that we share. Uh, when I when I work with, with, with male artists, I, I kind of try to be more, and have more empathy on, on how they look at things uh, from their own point of view. They they make fun of me. We laugh. It's 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 you know I've been we're, I've been writing a lot of reggaeton, urban music lately, and it's a completely different environment. And the words that they use, and you know, as long as they respect me, they oh, they always call me like "hola profesora," no, you know, because they're like well, most of the of the urban artists I work with, they're like the oldest is like twenty five, and I'm fifty three. So it's like, but we still manage to get along and find a uh, common ground and I learn from them and they learn from me from my experience and and it's good. I I, I have a lot of like like favorite co-writers that are male where artists from I mean, Infonsi, Noel, Gianmarco, Beto Cuevas. I get along incredibly well with them. We've known each other for so many years. We're friends. So so it works. It works. I can make it work. <laughs> So now that you mentioned that you're working with reggaeton um, and reggaeton historically has been known for having a lot of profanity in the lyrics, um, hypersexualized lyrics, uh, lyrics that are not very empowering for women. Um, how does that affect you as a songwriter? Because personally knowing your trajectory and the type of songs that you've written, um, I can imagine that this could possibly be a conflict for you. and. I know you're a person of integrity, and I know that you you wouldn't you would never write something that didn't fall in line with your moral compass. Uh, so how is it how is it writing a reggaeton song these days, given given the nature of the genre? Well, I mean, my name is going to be in it if I write the song. So right. I need to make sure that if my name is going to be on the credits, every word that's in there doesn't clash with my way of looking at things or my position as a woman or, or what I think about respect from guys to 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 from the guys to the women. So I'm I mean when there's there, there's something that someone suggests to me and I think it's off, I'll say, you know what, I don't want my name in it if you want to keep that line. Right. Why don't we say this other way? What What do you want to like? But but anyways, I mean, I think that my contribution into the urban world is more like when they come to me, they really want 
it feels like they want to improve the genre and come up with a song that's something that has more content contenido to it. Mm -hmm. so I that's that's what I can bring. So right. so they they when I say things in a certain way that it's not what they're used to saying used to use, they find it interesting and they take it and they use it, which is good. Right. Good. Because, because it's a different. I mean, I understand that my vocabulary might be completely different. I wasn't raised in the streets, so and I read books a lot. So I mean, I'm a reader. So it's like probably sometimes I bring up things that are too complicated, and I understand that we need to water them down, but mm -hmm. to fit in the song. But still, I can't just like go completely off right. from from what I believe because right. it's not me. I can't just can't do it. It would be it would be incredible if there was a genre of like intellectual reggaeton <laughs> along the lines of what Residente does, right? If there were more artists yeah. like that, it'd be it's amazing. A, like like I think I think like like a middle ground would be nice. A middle ground would be nice. Absolutely, I yeah. I agree with you. For I sure. am a fan of Residente, and I am also you know I love Logic, and I love Kendrick Lamar, and I love Eminem. Absolutely. But sometimes my daughter plays me some stuff that I, 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 I just can't <laughs> writing a song with a concept and a message and one thing is just to mumble whatever on top of a, of a track right 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 yeah so, yeah like, there's a fine line but i can i can see it i can see the line you know right <laughs> yes then no so <laughs> absolutely so uh, you recently launched a songwriting initiative, Cancion de Autor, right? Um, <laughs> and so that, and it, initially that was benefiting Music Cares, which is a Grammys nonprofit, uh, which provides a financial, medical, and personal emergency sure. assistance for its members. But now you are developing your own nonprofit organization. So tell us more about this initiative. Well, it's actually, Lauren, it's actually the other or the other way around, but it's it's totally fine. What what happened? Oh, I apologize. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. All good. Um, it, because it's complicated to explain. I think it was around April or no March when things started getting complicated with the pandemic and all. And I was like, what? People are are really looking into find uh, content online and seeing, watching things because you know they're bored at home and. And I was like, why don't I put together this group of songwriters and we start playing our songs and in, in, in the naked as they came out in the beginning before Ricky Martin or Enrique or uh, Shakira or Anaí or uh, Natalia Jimenez or Rake recorded them. Why don't we, the songwriters, present them the way we wrote them so people can have access to know who we are? Because right. the truth is, like, the songwriters, I believe, deserve the highest respect because if it wasn't for our songs, careers wouldn't exist, uh, labels wouldn't exist, uh, managers wouldn't exist, PR companies wouldn't exist. They need a song. The artist needs a great song just to portray what he is and, 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 and show it, give it to the audience. So uh, the fact that we are never mentioned, that we never get the credits right, that we have all this ordeal with Spotify where we're getting paid pennies uh, that are not, we're not treated with respect. That an, art, an artist goes up on stage and says, uh, he gets the, 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 the Grammy for song of the year and they don't say, if it wasn't for so and so. Usually you never get that. Right. So, uh, so the, the audience thinks that that song was written by that guy that went up on stage to grab the Grammy but the song was actually written by three other guys who no one knows that were in the studio for two or three days trying to come up with a wonderful hit song. So I thought, okay, let's put my friends together. Let's 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 start with a WhatsApp group. So we started the WhatsApp group, and it was like 65 of us from you know uh, Spain, Mexico, Argentina, Chile, Uruguay, Dominican Republic, um, Puerto Rico, Panama. Um, some guys that live in the U.S., Cuba, and, and we put together this, this thing called Cancion de Autor, uh, and we opened a Facebook page that's Cancion de Autor Oficial and an Instagram page that's Cancion de Autor Oficial too, where you can follow us. And then I said, okay, we're going to start putting up uh, videos of us singing our songs. 
And then since I'm on a, I'm a trustee for the, for the recording academy and I was, um, they, they told me, like, if you have any initiative that could be something that we could put up online that would make, uh, that would help us donate, uh, have people donate money for, for music cares, just make, make a proposal. So I right. spoke to them and I said, listen, I have all these songwriters that are from all over Latin America. They're willing to help. Why don't you put together, why don't we put together a series of concerts in Facebook Live so people can watch it and donate. And in the meantime, they get to see who is the guy who wrote, uh, I don't know, Pepe Aguilar's last single. Because we have all of the, the ones that we have in the group, we're 65. They all, they are, they're all amazing. They all have done something like really unique. They all have Grammys, multi platinum record sales. So, but they're all songwriters that most of the people don't know. We have some, some uh, artists in the group, like, you know, that are singer songwriters, like Gianmarco Noel, Rosana, Coti, um, Luis Enrique, Gucci, Amaury Gutierrez. They all, they all also, Alejandro Lerner, they all have their own career as a song, as an artist. But they have written their own songs and they have written songs for other people. So we put this together, we connected with Music Care. So um, we, we did four shows. Um, one was hosted by Aureo Vaqueiro. The second one was hosted by Monica Vélez. The third one was hosted by me. And the four, fourth one was hosted by Erika Ender. And there were three, um, three um, songwriters on each show. And it went really great. And, and we got a lot of money from Music Cares, which was the most important thing. So right. now, now that we're done with that, the next step is like to, to finalize putting it together as a nonprofit and see right. what else can we do like for the community, like, like education, advocacy, uh, put together shows for song, to showcase uh, songwriters' talent. I mean, there's a lot to do and, right. and we're all put doing it by heart. So it's not, we, we don't have any like big sponsors yet or anything. So it's, 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 it's a labor of love. Right. Beautiful. Beautiful. Okay. Perfect. And so, um, you're also teaching a songwriting masterclass as if you're not busy enough. <laughs> Can you share details and tell us like, um, if you're an aspiring songwriter, how can they join your class? What does it entail? Um, we'd love to know more about your songwriting masterclass. Uh, the masterclass, um, I'm teaching them every two or three weeks. The next one is actually tomorrow, July 10th. Tomorrow is going to be the whole day. It's a long one. Um, is there still room to sign up for anyone yeah, watching? There is, there is. I left it open, especially because I knew I was going to be um, talking about it at the ASCAP experience. Yes, there's still room. Uh, they usually take not more than 20 per class because it's a lot. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a workshop. It's mostly theory with a lot of examples. I think that that my, my, my main goal when 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 the kids sign up and they're in there is that they listen to to music with a different mindset once they took the class because right. when you when you get the get the info and the data on what what structures a song can have in any genre what are the what's the concept where the title should go how important is the the amount of words that the title has um what are the rhymes um, what are the instrumental hooks? What are the real hooks? What are the outros? How it works in reggaeton? How it works in bolero? How it works in pop? I mean, because I, I had the, the the I was so lucky to to write music in so many different genres, and they all have their thing. And since I I usually collaborate with a lot of songwriters that belong in different genres that are not pop, I got to learn a lot from them. So I think that the most important thing that the kids get out of my classes that are, again, long, and you have to be very focused because there's a lot of information, uh, is um, to understand that a song cannot be heard anymore like just a song. You have to listen to a lot of things, and then, and then when you get all the details, you can say, oh my God, this is a great record. This is a great song. This is so smart. This line is so incredible, and people don't don't pay attention to that. So if you want to write songs, you need to, you need to make sure you you haven't had those elements. 
and also that they would understand how important it is to collaborate because I wouldn't have I wouldn't be where I am right now if I did not learn from my peers. Right. From my peers that write regional Mexican, from my peers who write salsa, from my peers who write alternative, they all gave me, they all taught me so much so that now I can navigate all those waters and not feel like I'm lost here. What am I supposed to do? So uh, the classes are, 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 I usually do two days. This time is gonna be one full day, uh, which is tomorrow. And it's, it's usually 20 students max. And, uh, and I try to bring all, always some guests. Uh, the last time we were honored to have uh, Gabriela Gonzalez from who's the head of ASCAP Latina. And oh my God, they, they bombarded her with questions. They didn't know she was gonna be there. I told them like five minutes before. And, and it's interesting because, you know, students, they don't know how to, how to register a song. They don't know what a publishing deal is. They don't know right. if you need an attorney or you don't, how much an attorney charges, if they can belong to SACEM and also be ASCAP. I mean, there are so many questions. It's a, it's right. a universe, you know? So yeah, you always need an attorney. I always tell everyone that, always. <laughs> Make sure you have a great attorney from day one. Yeah. Um, so we have time, uh, we have about 10 minutes. We have time for two more questions. Um, and that leads me to the next question. So, uh, what personal and professional advice would you offer to young female aspiring songwriters who want to have promising careers in the industry? I think that, uh, if you're completely unknown and you want to get your songs out there and find a way for those songs to connect to the right people, I think the writer societies, ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, in the US um, are very helpful, can be very helpful for someone that does not have an in, you know, the first, uh, como se dice, el primer pie en la, poner el pie en la industria. The foot in the door. Yeah, foot at the door, because because the, the people that work at the writer society, they're they're very, you know, they have an empathy for writers that are starting and if they see something that's unique and that, that makes a difference, they will make sure that you take your song to whomever is going to be open to hear that song. Right. Yeah. Uh, also, I think it's very important to keep in mind because we all did it when we started. Uh, that when you when you're going to have a meeting, even with someone from the writer society, you need to make sure that what you bring to that meeting is pure gold or at least it's gold for your standards. So right. you need to run, if you have 10 songs you've written, you don't go to the meeting with 10 songs. Mm -hmm. You run those songs amongst certain people that you think at least have some, a good year for music, and then you go to reduce that to two songs. Right. that everyone thought that were, that were amazing. Because when you have, when you go to that meeting, even if we at the writer society or with an A&R or whoever you are manager of a, an unknown artist that you run into, mm. they, they're going to give you 10 minutes of their attention. Yes. Maybe if they get very enthusiastic, you'll get half an hour the first time. But whenever you, you press play and they get to listen to your stuff, you have to make sure that what you bring, it's gold. Right. Because if, if you're putting your foot at the door and what you bring doesn't catch their attention, it's over. Yep. It's very hard to get the second chance because there's like zillion of, of people that are looking for that person to listen to their songs. Right. So I think it's very important that you have a very strong power of, uh, how do you say, autocritica? Self-critique critique and, and bring it to someone else and make sure that what you're, what you're bringing to the table, it's, it has to be great because if it's great and that person from ASCAP thinks that, I don't know, Tommy Torres would benefit or right. uh, I don't know, um, Julia Michaels would benefit from sitting with you because you have something unique that would blow her mind, they mm -hmm. might put you in touch with that person and right. that would be your break. Right. So yeah. it's so important that if you have, if you are going to see and present something, if the course isn't a bomb or the concept isn't unique 
or the, 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 the presentation, the production isn't amazing and different, just don't even waste your time until you have it ready to go because right. it will kill you in, in five minutes, you're dead. Right. But so first impressions are everything. Everything. Comparable to going on a date, right? You're not going to go on a date with someone you're interested in and looking all disheveled, right? Exactly. <laughs> first impressions are everything. If you don't make a good first impression the first time, it's really difficult to get your foot in the door the second time. Total. I remember, yeah. I, don't, I don't know how much time we have. It's probably We have five more minutes. Five more minutes. And we have how many more questions? One? Just the last one. Oh, okay. So I can, I can give you this little story. Uh, yeah, sure. Any story. Uh, I was, I was, uh, when I arrived here in 98, I had a list of people that I had to meet. Mm -hmm. And one of the persons in my, in, one of the people in that list was Humberto Gatica, who's an amazing producer and engineer uh, from Chile, but he had done everything. Quincy Jones, We Are the World, Celine Dion, Josh Grover, Buble. I wanted to meet that guy. And everyone told me, you don't. You don't call him. You don't email him. You don't bug him because when you do that, you're out. Because he's a, he's he's amazingly talented, but he's a rough person. So I I I I uh, I obeyed and I didn't call him. And three years into being here, or two years, I got a call to work on uh, the the album Uno from La Ley, mm -hmm. and Humberto was the producer. So I got in the studio with Beto Cuevas and Beto told me, I want you to come to the studio and sit in the corner because if I need to make any changes on the words, I need you to be there for me. So I said, I arrived in the studio, Humberto was on the board and I sat in the back. And I was only interacting with Beto, letting him know, I mean, giving him alternatives if he wanted changes. And then when it was like, 5 p.m., Beto finished his cutting his vocals, and I said, okay, I'm going to go. And Umberto turned and said, there's a piece of paper here. Can you please write down your name and your number? <laughs> that was my only interaction with him, or the only. Two years later, <laughs> he called me and he said, Claudia, I'm here at David Foster's studio in Malibu. Josh Groban is recording a song and we need Spanish lyrics. Can you come here in an hour? That was it. <laughs> which is crazy, but I, right. had not, I had to learn which were the rules. Right. Because if I would have called him 20 times trying to leave him cassettes in his mailbox, I would yeah. be dead. You know, right, right. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> so I think it's interesting. It is definitely. Um, so lastly, uh, what would you say if you think about a body of work, if you think about one song that could define Claudia Brunt as an artist and songwriter that we can have our audience today say, listen to this one song and this pretty much embodies who Claudia is, who she stands for. What would you say that is? It could be a body of work. It could be an album. It could be a song. I mean, it's it's very hard to say. I was thinking about it. I think there are there are there, uh, as body of work. Uh, everything I've done with with Luis Fonsi or Natalia Jimenez or Noel uh, Shahris from Sin Bandera is very important in my career because. I, I, I wrote so many songs with the three of them that mm -hmm. made such an impact. Also La Santa Cecilia, which is a completely different genre, but but also with them I did so I made so much music and so much music that I still I still sit down and listen and I'm 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 very proud of. Uh, but then as an artist, as a singer songwriter, I believe that probably my album Sincera was 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 a collection of, of the best the best work that I that I could do. So I'm I'm really I'm really proud of it. And that's the album that you uh obtained the Grammy for. So yeah. everyone should go out and listen to Sincera. It's a beautiful body of work. And we this concludes um our chat. It was such an honor to uh have this conversation with you, Claudia. I'm so proud to call you a friend and a colleague and I hope everyone who is watching today um, 
got a lot of insightful information and good luck to everyone who's an aspiring songwriter. Yes, thank you so much. We really appreciate that. Thanks for the beautiful conversation. Thank you.